Hi, everybody, and welcome to Liberty Me You. We're here tonight with Dana Martin. Uh, Dana is an activist, educator, and the author of two books, Radical Unschooling, A Revolution Has Begun, and Sexy Birth. Uh, she has been featured on many TV shows and various other shows, and she uploaded the first video ever about unschooling for YouTube. So we're really excited to have her here at Liberty Me You. And without further ado, Dana Martin. And thanks for having me tonight. I'm excited to be here. Uh, th this came about really interestingly. I, I was at an event in Vancouver, the Capital Capitalism and Mortality Conference, and I uh, heard Jeffrey Tucker, and I really enjoy the other speakers, but he blew me away in his authenticity and his ability to really just connect with your heart and and speak from a, such a loving space that I just loved his words, and I couldn't take my eyes off him, and I, I took everything he said so seriously and I learned so much from him in just the short time that he presented. Uh, we just connected and, and I thought he was great and he asked if I'd come on and offer a class after he heard me speak. So I'm here as a resource for you. I'd like to share a little bit about radical unschooling philosophy. It is a twofold philosophy and I'm sure a lot of you have heard the term unschooling. Unschooling is not doing school at home, is it's living life as though school doesn't exist. And but it's but it's not uneducating. I think that's an important aspect to share with you is unschooling is not uneducating. It's just not doing school. A lot of people don't like the label because it shares what we don't do, but doesn't share what we do. Radical unschooling takes the trust that parents have an education one step further. I, I have four children, two boys and two girls. They're ages six, nine, 13 and almost 16. And my son, Devin, who's almost 16, uh, He's never been to school. None of my kids have been to school, but they've taken it one step further. They've never been punished either, none of them. Uh, we've never lived in an authoritarian parenting dynamic. We've always lived in partnership. So I'm here to share with you both sides of the philosophy, both, both the educational side and the parenting side. And I think most of you here tonight probably really understand the educational side. We don't want to indoctrinate our children. Schools focus on obedience above all else. Uh, very little learning happens. And schools were designed to create really good factory workers and good worker bees. And that's not what I want for my kids. I want my children to be free thinking entrepreneurs. I want them to be happy above all else. And age segregation is very damaging. And that's something that my kids don't have any concept of. They've never been put in a class. And the parenting aspect is another whole level of challenge for people. I um, have spoken a lot in the last couple of years after being on Stefan's show, uh, many different anarchist and libertarian interviews with different people and just introducing this concept because people get it. The world is ready for this. It is an evolution of, of the rights of children, which is something very few people talk about. We talk about human rights in every other area, but children are kind of the last on the human rights agenda in some ways. And uh, the way that we're told to parent by experts and our family and friends is focused on behavior, behavior modification. I mean, think of the shows like Nanny 911 and, and all of these shows on TV. They're all focused on behavior modification and punishing and rewarding for behavior. And you hear terms like uh, gentle discipline, which focuses on timeouts rather than spanking. And although that is an improvement on uh, peaceful parenting, it, it's so far from where we need to go with children's rights. So in the traditional dynamic of parenting, the focus is on the parents' needs, pretty much the parents' needs only. The parents' needs for quiet, uninterrupted sleep, obedience and compliance, of course, and training, training your children. So this is a really different uh, perspective. So uh, he, here, uh, take what you want and leave the rest during this talk, because some things I share with you might be a little too radical uh, for you to apply in your own life, but I, I guarantee once you're parenting this way a while, it, it won't seem so crazy <laughs> down the road. Um, so we focus on the needs under our children's behavior. Instead of controlling behavior, we help them get what they want in life. My children are um, not only my children, but they're my friends. They like to be around my, my husband and I, and um, they trust us. So we don't need to use any kind of behavior modification techniques. They believe us when we give them information, and they turn to us for that kind of information. It, it's kind of like... Um, you know, if you had somebody come visit you from a different country that wasn't familiar with the customs here, what would you say? What would you share? You know, you want to communicate information to your children about what 
is like socially acceptable, what's appropriate, those kind of things. And I know that varies and it has to do with uh, where you're at. But all in all, when I give my children information, they appreciate it and they thank me. So, for example, before we go into the library, I remind them it's a place where people generally like to read and, you know, they like it kind of quiet and they, they say, OK, thanks. I don't threaten them. I don't say you're not going to be able to watch that TV show tonight if you're loud. We, I talk to them and I respect them like I would any of you, um, other adults, people I care about. Uh, family or friends. So I am happy to take any kind of questions you have tonight, And but I'll, first I'll share a little bit more. So if we don't live life with school, how do our children learn? Well, we just prioritize. We reprioritize, I should say, and prioritize family first, where if you have a child in school, even a private school, even Waldorf, Montessori, I know a lot of you are more open to, to alternative schools, and although they're a little better, they still are operated under the assumption that children need training and that there's a certain set uh, curriculum that kids need to learn to be successful. Uh, there's a process called de-schooling that many parents have to go through in order to really unbrainwash themselves as to seeing learning in a certain way. For example, we don't break life down into subjects. We don't say this is math, English, science. We, we don't live like that at all. Uh, everything is just learning and everything is just life because I'm not sharing with you right now what subject this is. It's just something you're interested in learning about. And um, however, although we don't break life down into subjects, if you were to break down everything my children do in a day or in a week, it, you would see it does touch on all the subjects. So we put family before the institution. When you have a child in school, it's not freedom. I'm sure many of you get that. You have to ask permission from the institution to be with your child. How can anybody not see how unjust that is? You have to write a permission slip and ask them permission to take your child out of the institution. That's ridiculous. I, I, it makes me so upset that so many parents don't see that as uh, just like prison. It, it's Schools today are not designed like they were uh, Well, with the intention of schools. It's, it's interesting because if you read the history of public education, and I really recommend John Taylor Gatto. He's an amazing author. He was New York City Teacher of the Year for like four years in a row, and he endorsed my book. He's an amazing man. I spent quite a bit of time with him over the years, and uh, he wrote the book Dumbing Us Down. So if you guys want to learn um, the history of schooling, and it'll blow your mind. So if you're thinking of, of stepping into a life like this, you really have to take the time to unbrainwash yourself as seeing schools the, for what they were meant to. It's been hidden from us. You know, people have lied to us and it's been hidden from us as to what schools are designed for. But they're honestly designed to, for obedience above all else. And the labels that we get in school stay with us for life. My husband was labeled dyslexic really early on and they put him in the resource room. I don't know what it's called now, but for even today, he carries the idea that he's a really bad speller and he feels stupid in a lot of ways. He, he says that to me from the way that uh, they, they told him he was in school because he didn't fit into the box. So many people, oh my gosh, you, you know the kids labeled with ADD and ADHD? You might argue with me as to whether or not that's a valid uh, label, but it, it's it's really kids not doing what the adults want them to do. Have you heard of this uh, opposition defiant disorder? I mean, that is, it makes my skin crawl, that, that children that aren't obeying and doing what other people are telling them to do when it doesn't feel right to them are labeled with a disorder and drugged. So there's many, many reasons why people should look into alternatives to the public school or even private school option. There is um, an incredible life waiting for you when you realize that success is not necessarily the key to happiness. It's the other way around and people have it so backwards. If you're happy now and you can live in freedom, and you spend your days pursuing your passions and interests with your kids, then you become successful on the other end of it. We have it so backwards. So um, one of the quotes, my family and I were on Dr. Phil about eight years ago, and that was kind of the, my introduction into um, appearing on television. It wasn't something I planned, and the experience was really interesting, and I learned a lot. It really started this whole um, spiral for me of advocacy through the media, which I've gotten a lot of interesting uh, criticism for, for taking this grassroots philosophy into the media. People get really scared. They're afraid that there's going to be more regulation by talking about it, and people like to kind of keep it secret. But the truth is we have to speak out about this and not be ashamed. Our children learn, learn amazingly well. 
And um, I've introduced this to a lot of different people. I actually have had a lot of um, well, Hollywood actors that want their kids to be able to be educated, but they don't want to put them in school. Unschooling is a great option. Um, you know, isn't it fascinating that if a child is an actor or a child is really good at sports, for example, that we excuse them from school to pursue that kind of passion because our culture happens to value um, the media, TV, being on TV or movies more. But what if my child wants to do something else? My son's a blacksmith. Why isn't he offered that same uh, granted excuse to not be in school to pursue blacksmithing? We live in such a hypocritical, crazy, crazy world right now. So I want to be here for you as a resource. And um, John Taylor Gatto, definitely read his work. Another awesome author is Alfie Cohen. He's a teacher, and he talks about uh, punish punishments and rewards being really damaging. And that's something that I expand on and share more about that and why. I want my children to be internally motivated to do what feels best to them. Punishments and rewards focus on the external, on the external control and, and motivation through through things that aren't really true to their heart, but it's it's fear or reward that guides them. And that's that's not um, how I want my children to operate. So I want them to be able to be happy and pursue their interests. And my children learn based on what they're interested in. I use whatever their passion or interest is at the time as the nucleus of their learning. So say, for example, when my son Devin was really into Legos when he was four or five years old. So I, I found it to be my role as their learning facilitator. So keep in mind, I'm not my child's teacher. That's something that a lot of people that think about homeschooling um, have a hard time with because they say, I, I, I don't have the credentials. I don't want to be a teacher. I don't know how to do that. And um, that's not what I'm saying your role is. What your role is is to be your child's learning facilitator. So you don't need to know all the answers, but you do need to know how to find answers. So I brought as many resources as possible for my children to learn and grow from. And when Devin was into Legos, I subscribed to Lego Magazine. So he'd be surrounded with a written word. And he was internally motivated to learn how to read because it was a useful tool to him. So uh, while surrounding my child with many different resources based on their passions and interests, they learn as a side effect of that. So I help parents during coaching calls brainstorm on ways to bring different resources in depending upon what the child's interest is. So a big question, especially in your community, guys, that I get all the time is what about reading? What about writing? What about math? People want to know. People want their children to be reading as young as possible so they can empower themselves. It's a wonderful intention, and I truly understand it. However, unless a human being has internal motivation for this tool or the need to read and write, um, forcing them generally causes a lot of angst. It causes disconnect between parent and child. It's completely unnecessary to force. And to, to be honest with you, learning to read is really easy. It's a lot easier than you're led to believe it is. However, we were taught that children need to learn to read around age six because, but you know why? Like if you learn why this all is, it makes so much more sense to you because after the second or third grade, depending upon the school, the curriculum for the teacher is all in the written word. So if they don't have everybody reading by the same age, they can't take that extra time with children. So instead of understanding that there's a wide range of normal for reading readiness, if children don't fall under the, the norm, meaning what all the other kids are doing, if somebody's like a late reader, they get labeled and, and put in different classes and pushed down a class. And um, it's not for the greater good of the child at all. It's for the benefit of the teacher. It's for the benefit of the adults, for the authority to need you all to read at a certain age. With unschooling, totally different mindset. Uh, now, this might blow your mind. Keep open-minded for a minute, but the average natural reading age for the unschoolers that I've worked with and known, keep in mind it's hundreds of kids, is between the age of anywhere between the age of five and like 12. There's a huge range of normal as to when children are ready to read. And I'd say the average is between 10 and 11 years old when kids pick up reading and writing, like fluently, for their own need as a tool. Now, they're not behind. These kids that pick up reading later than kids in school are not behind. They're not starting, um, they're not starting back with uh, age six reading material. They're starting with already ahead of their age group. Devin learned to read around the age of between nine and 10, my oldest, and he learned to read uh, through being surrounded with a written word. I read to him since he was in the womb. I love to read, seeing parents that love to read, see, seeing us model that reading is an amazing tool and 
something that can help us get more of what we want in life. And he was internally motivated because he wanted to chat on a game. And he asked me, you know, I want some resources to learn more. And we did that. And it looked really different than a child learning to read in school. It looks a lot different, the process. But he, he the first book series he read was the Harry Potter series. He was already past his age level. So he skipped over all of those torturous years of workbook pages and drills and reading and writing samples. He, he's, he's actually right before I came up here, I said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to go up and do this interview. All four of my kids are downstairs right now by themselves. So if you hear any random noises, <laughs> that's what it is. Um, he said he was writing a book. I was, I was like, all right, well, have fun with that. My daughter Tiffany's already written stories, um, fan fan stories. I forget what they're called, fan fiction for bands that she loves. So she was actually a little bit later in reading than Devin. She was 11 when she started to read fluently. But they they write a lot sooner. So anyway, just to give you a wide example, is my kids aren't behind at all. They're they're already probably further along than kids who are forced to read earlier. But it can it can look it can be really scary for parents that are really unsure about this life to have a you know eight and nine year old not reading yet. There are exceptions. I've known unschooled kids who are reading at age five, and uh, somebody I talked to last night their their child was reading even sooner. So you you may not be on that far end, but uh, just like natural weaning, it all happens when the child's ready, when their brain is ripe and ready, and, and they just take it in easily. So, all right. So I would love for you guys to be able to use me as a resource, ask me questions. I think people learn best from hearing real-life examples. So I've, I've shared a lot with you, and I want to expound on this and share more about it, but I'd love it to be perfectly catered to what you want to know about this philosophy because it, there's a lot to it. So if, um, Matt, if anybody has any questions, please ask me. Oops, sorry, go ahead. All right, if you'd like to ask questions, you can ask in text in the questions, chat, uh, questions tab to the right. Or if you'd like to uh, come on video, you can click video chatting above the chat window and then click start your webcam and I'll bring you on screen. Our first question is from Nathaniel Stover. He asks, how do you prepare kids for a profession or for an entrepreneurial venture? Can you take them to work with you or do you have your own business? Great question. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, our kids learn through what we model to them and what we share with them. Our kids are entrepreneurs based on the fact that we are. My husband has a, a business making wooden toys for a living. And um, I want my kids to know that they can make a living off of what they love. I, I think school really conditions people to be unhappy. I think, and, and the same with traditional homeschooling, when you're forcing a kid to do curriculum, it really teaches a child to be unhappy and do drudgery work. And my kids have no concept of that. They, they've never been forced to do anything like that. So they naturally make money off their passions. My son, Devin, who's 15, has an Etsy store. He's a blacksmith and a bladesmith, completely self-taught with me facilitating that, my husband and I. And um, he sells knives and he sells cutting boards. He's a woodworker. My daughter, Tiffany, is um, almost 13 and she's had a pet sitting business for about two years. So but it, but the facilitation of their entrepreneurship is very important. This is this is part of my role as an unschooling parent is to facilitate this for them. So I help them. I help with websites. I help um, we research together how the best terms for sales and so forth with Devin's shop and we research and visit um, different locations for Tiff to learn more about pet care. And uh, it's it's an amazing, exciting life when you are sharing with your children that they never have to work for somebody else. So that's something that we talk to our kids about often. But I also want them to know that if there's something that they love doing and they want to work for somebody else, then that's their choice. But um, so if that if that helps at all with your with your question, um, what, can you post the question again, Matt? I, I think I missed half of it. What was the other half? Can you post it twice? Okay, can you take them? Um, yeah, we don't. I don't take them to work. Well, actually, I do take them to work with me because they're here right now and I'm in my house and <laughs> I'm working. But um, I'm also a childbirth teacher and a doula, and a doula is kind of like a midwife, except we don't actually deliver the baby. So I've I, we've always had um, we we'd love to brainstorm on businesses as a family. We're 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 kind of crazy when it comes to the kids. And they have an interest or a really big skill in something. And we joke around about, okay, let's start, let's get the website, let's order the business cards. And 
I think the passion for being an entrepreneur is infectious. I think when you love what you do and you get excited about it and it becomes a focus and a goal, your kids just naturally pick up on what feels good and, and it's exciting. So Devin spent the entire day learning how to make um, these sandals. He made a sandal loom. He learned about the skill. He's into, he's into primitive skills. So one thing he's focused on for the long-term goal is interning with a, um, like a nature conser conservancy. I don't know how to pronounce it. What is it called? The nature conservatory or something. And he's going to be able to offer wilderness survival classes someday. So that's something he'd love to have a business doing. Okay, any more questions? That's neat stuff. Our next question is from Natasha Petrova. She asks, how do you recommend unschooling minded people approach college? Awesome question, Natasha. Um, if you do a Google search for unschooling in college, it is, you'll get so many amazing resources. There's people out there that write specifically about that. I run conferences, unschooling conferences, a, a couple times a year. It's called the Life Rocks Conference. And we have, um, this past year, I had somebody from, have you heard of UnCollege? Well, now you have. Do a search for UnCollege. And there are so many people writing about how college is just business. And you can learn everything you learn in college on your own. I mean, the resources that are out there now, you don't have to pay somebody to teach you. Although that really ties into this philosophy because children who have gone to school and have been trained to turn to experts to spoon feed them knowledge, you become really kind of lazy at self-motivated learning. My kids know how to learn. They don't need to turn to somebody else and sit in a class and say, teach me, spoon feed me this information. They know how to learn. And so they know, I think that's one of the greatest gifts that I, I give my children or unschooling parents give their kids is we we show them how to learn. And that when you learn how to learn, you don't, you don't ever need college. Unless you want to be something like a doctor, or lawyer, they're, they're very, very specified uh, professions. And in that case, th there's unschoolers that are in Harvard right now. So this this works as an option. But I think it's important to research the whole college kind of scam because, man, people are in debt big time for years from college when they didn't even need to go. Uh, as an interesting side note, our speaker on Tuesday night, David Friedman, uh, who's the son of Milton Friedman, he was unschooled. So, uh, and he was unschooled back in what? I guess he's uh, he's in his 60s, so it was uh, 40s and 50s, back before it was really a thing. I think that's really neat. I mean, he's a a PhD in physics who teaches economics at a law school. So. I mean, not every parent is Milton Friedman, but it, that's uh, that's maybe the high end, and that's awesome. So, our next uh, next question here is from uh, Michael Esch. He asks, "How do you recommend, or uh, how do you know what to expose your children to? Like, how did you know to let your kids play with Legos?" Well, I think somebody gave us some. We went somewhere and he played, my children played with them and Devin liked them. So I bought him some. It became such a passion of his that, um, my gosh, we invest. He really liked the Star Wars Lego kit. So we'd go to the store and he'd buy them or we'd order them on eBay. And um, yeah, so whatever you can bring into your house. I don't, I don't want to narrow my children's life and world. I think a lot of people that traditionally homeschool for religious reasons, they want to—they kind of want to keep their kids in a box of their ideals, where this is very different. We want our kids to have as huge of a possible world to learn and grow from. And so I bring a lot of different things into my children's life. I feel it's part of my role, but I know that everybody has different financial situation. So there's only so many resources people may think. However, you can get a lot of things without money. Um, so yeah, I just bring my kids to explore a lot. We used to go to museums and they would play with the Legos there, the children's museums. And so I just, when you know your kids, you know, it's really an interesting question. I've never had anybody ask me, how do you know what to expose them to? I think it's just from knowing your kids. If you are attached and you take their cues from the beginning, I never listened to what experts told me from, from birth with my kids. We, they didn't, we, I, my kids have never slept in a crib. They were always with us because they wanted to be. Um, my kids nursed till they were done nursing. I always trusted them. I didn't wean them before they were ready. And so we've always had this really close connected relationship. And I knew what Devin was into. And so 
it's interesting how one passion and interest leads to the other. And, and because of his interest in Star Wars Legos, he then liked Star Wars, which led to learning about space, space in general, and um, everything just kind of branches off one another. A great question. Our next question is uh, from Nathaniel. He asks, can you talk about interning or apprenticeship and how do you fit young children into this type of situation? I love this question. Mentorships and apprenticeships are so overlooked as a resource and there are so many people dying to share their passions with you and with your kids for free even. When Devin was interested in blacksmithing, um, he had learned how to build a forge. YouTube is an amazing resource, by the way. My kids have learned so much on YouTube. Um, I, I contacted a local blacksmith and just asked the guy. I said, hey, my son's interested in blacksmithing. He was so excited that there was a young person interested in blacksmithing. He offered to come over. And he came over and he mentored Devin for the day. He taught him about safety. He even gave him an anvil, which is something Devin wanted so much. And they're expensive. Really heavy, too. Took a couple guys to load that up. But um, mentorships, reach out and ask people. People love to share their passions. And I find that kids, well, human beings learn best when you're surrounding them with passionate people. How about a teacher in school stand in front and teach about all these different subjects and possibly be passionate about it? They're not. They might be passionate about teaching, but passionate about the topic? No, that's not something I ever came across until college. When I was in college, um, I remember my astronomy teacher was so passionate about it. It just it was infectious. I became so passionate about astronomy myself, and I still am to this day. I'm a total sky junkie and love astronomy because of this man's passion it just infected me. And so anything your kids are interested in, look around for people to mentor them. Invite them over. Go explore places. If your kids are interested in fire trucks, call the fire department, man. You don't have to go. You don't have to get a book out about fire trucks. How boring. I mean, that's one resource if your kids want to learn that way. But learning through human to human interaction is something that so few people utilize. So, yes, mentorships, it's a big deal and it's really important. And all of my kids learn through mentorships and apprenticeships. Now, a lot of uh, critics of unschooling tend to say that, you know, you know, maybe unschooling is fine for some children. Maybe some children can self-lead and kind of communicate what they're interested in. But other children, oh, what if they just want to sit in front of the TV all day and do nothing? What do you say to those critics? This is a really um, multi-layered, complicated answer. And I'm going to tell you, <laughs> kids that have been controlled have a very different warped relationship with such things like technology, for example, or foods and so forth. My kids have total freedom with media, foods, and bedtimes. Now, that, those are the three like real big hot topics when people first learn about this life, and they make assumptions that if a child had freedom with bedtime, food, and media, that they do nothing but eat chocolate, cookies, watch porn, and, and sleep all day, and not go to bed till four in the morning. I mean, just totally outrageous assumptions. The truth is, when kids have freedom surrounding these things, they have a real balance, and they utilize them in the same way we do. I'm not sure how much you guys utilize technology, but you use it a, a lot sometimes if you're really into researching something or passionate about something. And other times you might go days without researching something on the Internet. Kids are no different. Um, however, if a child is controlled and there, you had limits on something, because it develops a warped, disconnect relationship with it, children, even very, very young children, have a really deep, natural, instinctual need for freedom and autonomy. It's part of being human. And when you limit a child and you threaten them and you say you can only do what you want for an hour, their desire for freedom and autonomy overrides everything, even what they were actually wanting to do. So then that's all they want to do. They, they just crave this. And um, when people first come to this life and they, they release limits, children very oftentimes will do nothing but watch TV that they want to do, uh, play video games or whatever it is constantly just to make up for all the time it was limited. And also, they don't know if the parent's going to take away that thing that they love again. They don't, they don't, the trust needs to be rebuilt and balance needs to be, be formed. <coughs> Excuse me. A child really can self-regulate, although I kind of hate that term because it sounds like you're uh, kind of self-disciplining and stopping yourself from doing something. So I don't really like the term self-regulation, but I think it can be helpful for people that are learning about this life. Um, I'd, I'd say balance is more of an appropriate term. Children find balance in everything. Um, there's days where my kids never even turn the TV on. And then there's days where they're really into movies if it's a rainy day. So, um, 
But another layer of that is when you have children that know you really well, and I'm assuming most of you have very close connected kids, even if you go through the motions of freedom and letting go of control, if your heart's not in it, your kids know it. So they're, it's still not real freedom if they know you're judging it and not feeling good about it. So if you want to lift limits surrounding these things, it's important to research why and feel really good about doing it. That way you're, you're, uh, the, the energy surrounding letting go of limits is really authentic. It's not conflicted with what your feelings are, if that makes sense. Uh, Nathaniel Stover asks, with unschooling, how do you teach things like time management or focus, which are critical to entrepreneurs? It's hard to understand because so many of us were conditioned to do things we didn't want to do, and we were told that it was good for good for us. And I don't believe that it is. I feel like if a child or any human being really wants to be doing something, then they they willingly do it. They go through what's necessary to do it, just like you do. Um, I don't think it's something that you need to force a child to do. Um, it just unfolds naturally. It takes my son a lot of focus and time to create a really nice sword or blade. And um, time management, he has freedom. He has all the time in the world. So <laughs> he can do whatever he wants with his time. But the time management does unfold uh, if he has a lot of things planned for the day. But he creates his own day. I mean, so it just I think it's a really time management is a natural thing that unfolds when children have freedom. Our next question is from Michael Esch. He says, in uh, respect to peaceful parenting, what do you do if one of your children hits the other? Are you thinking of a certain age, Michael? Because age is kind of, I mean, you're talking a two-year-old or a 12-year-old, so it's different. A three-year-old, uh, He says okay. he has a three-year-old. Yeah, I just saw that. Um, Hitting is a form of communication for children that age, three, four, five years old. And it's generally a late indicator that they weren't heard before it got to that level of communication. I think children use hitting as a last resort to be heard. I don't think that they think of it as violence. It's just how they communicate sometimes. And I, I feel that um, generally it's an indicator that I wasn't really present enough with whatever was going on. Is this with another sibling, Michael? Oh, so, so if your three-year-old hits your one-year-old, is that what you're asking? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, a generally a three-year-old, if, if it would be an indicator that you're not necessarily watching what's going on. It just is a cue for me to put on my best parenting skills and just be present. A three-year-old and one-year-old should not be alone together, for one, because they don't, three-year-olds don't know enough really how to um, keep a one-year-old safe. So my babies, when they were one, were always in the sling or baby carrier for safety. They were always on me, so I knew. So generally, they like to be held a lot. But if that happens, generally, it's a really um, just a passing phase. And so say that happens. Say the actual scenario happened where your three-year-old hit your one-year-old. If that was me, I would go down to their level and just say, what's, you know, what's happening? How can I help you? Focus on the needs. There's a reason for the hitting. Where our culture just focuses on the behavior, how to control the hitting. Well, it's excruciatingly frustrating to children. To have somebody not even understand or validate the fact that there was a reason for the behavior. And when you're only focusing on the behavior, you feel so unheard. You go through your whole life feeling completely misunderstood, like you don't fit in anywhere. Nobody understands you. Nobody's listening to you. I'm sure some of you can relate to that. This is, I don't focus on the behavior. There's times where I do, like after the fact, and I might say, oh, how can I, you know, how can I help you, buddy? What's going on? And, you know, please don't hit your brother. That hurts him. How can I help you? Or I might talk about the hitting after, but I know. Now, I assume positive intent for my kids, too. I think we live in a culture, and most of us were raised, where negative intent was assumed. I mean, look at the, our, our culture today. Every Negative intent is assumed from everybody. And that is a huge shift in um, personal perspective. I know my kids are doing the best they can with what they know at the time, all the time. I know that. And if a three-year-old, any child, but if a three-year-old's tired or hungry, of course they're going to be so frustrated. So it's a matter of opening your heart to understanding that they're doing the best they can with what they know. Are they tired or hungry? I would not even focus on the hitting. I would just help them, help them communicate and, you know, console the one-year-old, pick them up and love them, but don't scold and reprimand and get mad at your three-year-old um, because that's so excruciatingly confusing when all he was doing is just trying to communicate. So, um, yeah, and you don't have to get angry either. 
know, I think a lot of people get so angry um, over a child's negative behavior. And then you're just doing what the child is doing or you're modeling anger in the face of anger. Instead, you can be understanding and just console and hold the space for more positivity. I mean, when you get like, and don't let your emotions be so easily controlled. That's such an issue for people. So many issues for parents is if their kids are fighting or one of their children get angry, they get so mad. They get so angry and instantly you can go from like the best mood to a grouchy mood just because your kid's there. I'll tell you, as a doula, when I'm with a woman in labor, um, and I do this often, and I've perfected it. If a woman's going through transition and having a really rough time and saying things like, I can't do this anymore, this is so hard. Can you imagine what it would do to the birth if all of a sudden I got on that same energetic level and was like, oh my God, what's happening? This is so hard. It would like her, her labor would be profoundly affected. It would make everything so much worse. Instead, I know how normal it is. I know she's gonna get through it. I know that she's going to be pushing soon. So I just, my role is what I, I, I call it holding the space. I hold the space for positivity. I encourage like, hi, hear you. You're almost there though. You could do it. I've, I've applied this to parenting in the sense of when your children get so angry and they're going through a hard time, you need to hold the space. Don't let your emotions be so easily shifted and controlled by another human being's negative emotion. You maintain it, be positive, help them move through it quickly. And I'll tell you, we have the ability to make an issue between kids be like this huge thing by adding our negativity to it or we can just keep it for what it is something that they can move through really quick with our support and positivity so that was a really long answer i know but i hope it helped you a little michael uh Fu asks how does a person deprogram if they've internalized the don't try just wait for others idea um i'm not really sure what you're asking don't try, just wait for others' ideas. Can you reword it, please? I, I think he's... All right, uh, we'll move on to the next question and then uh, come back to it. Uh, Nathaniel asks, could you give some examples of how you involve your kids in home or yard work and business certainly okay well house cleaning how many of you walk around your house frustratedly picking up toys and huffing and puffing under your breath that oh, i can't believe this is such a mess you guys have to help with this and you're resentfully cleaning and doing dishes and bitching the whole time i'll tell you what does that teach kids what is that model for them that housework is no fun and it's something to get really upset about and angry about and hate doing. Well, again, it's a total shift in perspective and attitude. When I clean my house, um, I do it because I know it's a choice. That's nothing I have to do. I know that my family learns best when um, we're organized. There's many levels of cleanliness. I know everybody has different standards. I prefer a clean home with organization. I take the responsibility for that and doing it joyfully. I don't mean I sing the whole time I'm cleaning. I just mean I'm not resentful. I'm just grateful. So, so much of it's perspective and your gratitude and, and your attitude surrounding what you're doing. Uh, with four kids that learn at home and uh, are home with me, there's a lot of messes that happen. As they get older, they're able to help out and clean. But when they're little, you know, I look at anything I'm cleaning up as kind of a story of whatever just happened that day. So at the end of the day, I see little pieces of paper cut up in the corner. You know, little scraps of paper, and I think to myself, oh, I love that craft that they did. I'm so grateful for these kids that they're healthy, and that was so fun. And I'll pick it up with that attitude of um, being grateful for my family and my children's health and so forth. And um, I see everything as progress. So I might not get to everything I want to that day, but I look at every little bit as progress. So it, it's a really big difference, and I think this life really requires positivity and optimism. It, it does because it, it's it's your birthright truly to, to feel that way, but you're the only one that can change the way you feel about these kind of things. So if you were raised in a home where cleaning was looked at as resentful and you were forced to do chores, my kids do not have chores. However, they clean because it makes sense to do so. Not all the time. If I ask them, they'll help me. Um, and a lot of times I do most of it. I do a lot of it by myself, but before I came up here for this particular class, I asked Devin if you would mind emptying the dishwasher and he said, sure. Um, so as they get older, they've gone more. I help them when they're young to clean their rooms. 
um, when they're really little, to expect a very young child to clean their room is a really overwhelming task, and I don't put that on them. I always offer to help. And because I set the default setting for our home and their bedrooms to be clean and organized, that's what they get used to. And anything less than that, they're kind of uncomfortable with, and they ask for help. Or like my uh, my daughter Tiffany, who's almost 13, and Devin, who's 16, almost 16, they clean their own rooms. They totally help. But Ivy, who's nine, sometimes she gets a little overwhelmed, and I'll go in and give her a hand. Children learn from modeling, and if I help my kids out, they help me out. I don't make them do things just for the sake that they can do it all by themselves. That makes no sense um, to me. It's it's this partnership space of I help them out and they help me out when I need help. Um, and so it's really simple. It's not complicated. <laughs> so we don't have chores. Never have. Yet my kids how help. You, how do you deal with uh, what happens if you know one of your kids doesn't do what they've agreed to do. For example, if Devin uh, doesn't empty the dishwasher. Oh, well, it wasn't, it's not like an agreement that I make him like sign a contract or anything. I'll just remind him. It's not a big, what, what if my husband didn't when I asked him if he could? What would I do? What would you do if your partner didn't? Same thing with my kids. I just remind them or, or I would understand if he said, oh, sorry, I get caught up doing this. And I'll, I'd say, it's all right, no biggie. I'll do it later or you can do it when you have time. Spank him. <laughs> uh, how about like one, with Michael, some, I see that. something more formal as <laughs> uh, something more formal like a contract? What if your kids uh, have agreed very solemnly to do something and then it just doesn't? I've never set up that dynamic in my house uh, with my husband or my children or my best friend or my mother. We've never had contracts. It's not something I find to be peaceful. I mean, if somebody needs to sign a contract, that means that they don't really want to do it necessarily. It's everything's voluntary. Non-coercive, voluntary lifestyle. Contracts kind of indicate that you're afraid that they'll change their mind and you want to hold them to it. If my children change their mind, I respect that. And we find out why and we work together to find ways of everybody's needs getting met. Great question, though. All right, our next question is from uh, Nathaniel. I know you were teasing yes. me. How do you determine when, he, when a young kid is responsible enough for a task that is unsafe? Can you think of anything in particular, Nathaniel, that you're thinking of? Responsible enough for a task that isn't. Do you mean like playing with fire? So a task, though. Uh, are you looking for like a chore that's unsafe? Running a chainsaw. Oh, nice. oh, running a chainsaw. Oh, nice. OK. Well, I've never had my children ask to run a chainsaw. However, the fire is a really good one, and I'll tell you why. Uh, Devin was probably three years old when he was curious about matches, and he wanted to light some. He wanted to know what they were. So I took him downstairs into our cellar, and we have a huge wood furnace, and I let him, I showed him how to do it safely, and I sat right with him, and he lit match after match after match, and he played with fire in the wood stove. There was a paper, and he was lighting the paper on fire, and I was with him the whole time. Well, you know, weeks later, he was lighting candles at the kitchen table. He's always loved fire. And I think it's really um, natural for boys, especially, to love these primitive things that are, like, part of their DNA. You know, all these kind of hunting and fires. And I see shooting guns and dirt bikes and so forth. So let's, let's just stick with fire for a second. Um, I always supported Devin's desire to explore fire and play with fire. He um, moved up to building the fires when we needed them in the morning. But I was, I was with him and by his side. So this life is not for the lazy parent. And I think it's really unsafe to just give matches and say, OK, you, you have freedom. Go have fun with those. That's really irresponsible. And that's unparenting. And that's not what I'm talking about here. Having a rule for a child not to play with fire is lazy. Rules are a replacement for being there. And I consider that rules really lazy and easy. And they never work. And you're putting your children in such danger when you forbid or have rules against something. So we do not live life. That's not safe. My presence is what's safe. So I say yes. And I'm there by their side. Um, Devin is now a fire twirler. He does that by profession, I guess. He, he performs at events. He teaches other people how to twirl fire. He had a fire mentor when we went to Australia when he was only 
I think 11, 12 years old, he was really, oh, he's always loved fire, been so passionate about it. Now, as you know, which I mentioned, he's a blacksmith. He works with fires and uh, thousands of degrees hot. I mean, he's dealing with red hot um, pieces of metal and he would have never perfected that to the degree that he has. I mean, his, he's an artist with fire and it's a huge part of who he is. And it all started back when he was three years old and wanted to start exploring fire and me supporting that. So um, I show, we teach about fire safety though. I mean, it's important. We, we always have a fire extinguisher nearby. They know what to do if something comes up. Um, and yes, he has, I'm reading what Nathaniel's writing on the side. He has great respect for it as a tool, exactly. And he uses it safely. He knows, he built a survival shelter. He calls a lodge out in the woods. And he, he has a fire inside his lodge, but he knows how to do it safely. And um, he has much, much respect for it and for himself. He doesn't want to get hurt. He doesn't want to burn the woods down. But he loves cooking over it. And he loves uh, fire twirling. If any of you ever want to come to an unschooling conference and learn how to twirl fire yourself, that's part of what we do at the event is it's kind of a rite of passage and it symbolizes parents getting over their fear of trusting their children. Part of what parents do at this event is trusting their children to play with fire and learn to fire twirl. And I'll tell you, it's the most amazing process to see these parents so fearful, but yet willing. You know, we're standing by with fire extinguishers, extinguishers and there's a few different kids now that mentor younger kids in twirling fire. And just the symbolism of these kids having freedom and twirling this fire and the parents standing by watching, just awestruck. It, it's so powerful. Um, so, yeah, be there by their side. Of course, they can explore anything as long as you're there for support and facilitation. Uh, Fu has clarified his question a little bit. Uh, the original question okay. was, that how does a person deep program? if they have internalized the don't try, just wait for others idea. And he says, I mean, when there's the desire to learn or do something, but they never do it because, oh, I can't or shouldn't do this. There isn't a real reason. I think he's uh, maybe primarily referring to kids who have maybe not always been unschooled. But you're asking how to support that or how to how to deprogram from that process I, I just trust uh, just more freedom and I think kids really do distrust themselves if they've been programmed to when adults don't trust children which is the way a lot of us were raised we were we were raised not to be trusted negative in, uh, intent was assumed from us we were told that we weren't capable of so much that we weren't old enough to do this or not uh, able enough to do so many things that we internally wanted to do that we learn to not trust ourselves. And to this day, that affects so many of us. We don't trust ourselves. We're afraid. We, we have anxieties. We have neuroses. How many people are on medication and see therapy? All, I believe, that stems from the authoritarian paradigm way of raising children. So that's a really great, important question, Fu, for sure, that, you know, how do we offer this? And, and I work with parents on this and, and offering children more trust and more freedom and being by their side to encourage them. So there is a process of de-schooling or deprogramming for the child as well as the adult if the children child has been parented in a more authoritarian paradigm. Um, but it's an amazing process to see these kids just blossom into who they're meant to be. So I believe that anybody can heal from this type of mentality. I think it's harder for us as adults because we've been this way longer. <laughs> but um, great, great insight, great question. Yeah, the fear of failure, oh I'm reading God. that from Nathaniel. That's, that's intense, that yeah. fear of failure, because we were uh, graded and measured and compared so much as kids. My kids don't have any concept of that, which when I, when I say that, I don't want to sound like uh, my kids have an experienced life, but because I value all of their, they're not compared necessarily, and they don't feel like they fail. They just, there's no such thing as a mistake. And I, I think that's such an important thing to realize because so many of us, even as adults, if something goes wrong or we make a mistake, we look at it as failure. My kids really do look at mistakes as learning experiences. So again, it's this whole way of reframing these life experiences. But I think the kids really learn from how we face mistakes and how we face failure and how we approach it. I talk, I mean, one of the biggest tools for my kids in learning about life and about anything, subjects, topics, you name it, uh, is discussion. We talk about things all the time. 
uh, there's been different things that I've tried, different things as entrepreneurs we've ventured off to and they just haven't panned out. It wasn't the timing or it just wasn't the best implemented idea. And instead of saying, oh, we failed. Oh, my gosh, I failed at this. We say, eh, let's rework this. There must have been a kink in the plan. Let's figure this out. It's not a mistake. It's a learning opportunity. So, again, the culturally conditioned way that we view failure can be undone. And many people don't think of themselves as failures. So it's what you're modeling for your kids, though. All right, I'll put out exactly. a, uh, a last call here for questions and let people know what's going on this week at Liberty Me U. Uh, tomorrow night, we've got the continuation of Jeffrey Tucker's Liberty Classic series. He's going to be talking about uh, As We Go Marching by John T. Flynn. Uh, Monday night, uh, Zach Slayback is going to be giving a talk entitled Do You Hate the State? A Qualified Defense of Hatred and Contempt in Politics. Tuesday night, uh, the unschooled and uh, unschooling father, David Friedman, will be talking about the third edition of his book, The Machinery of Freedom, in an episode of our Authors Forum series. Wednesday night, Rick Rule will finish up his, or uh, not finish up, but give the third installment of his series on junior mining investment. And then Friday night, Joe Pirelli will talk about bug out bags and how to get started with prepping. So it's going to be an interesting week here at Liberty Me U. Hope to see all of you back. Uh, we've got uh, a, another question here uh, from Nathaniel. He asks, how do you deal with things like li lying or cheating? And then he clarifies and also on. Oh, I love this, Nathaniel. You are giving me so many amazing questions and things to elaborate on. If a child has freedom and there's no threat of punishment, there's no need to lie, cheat, or steal. Do you realize that people are turned into liars, cheaters, and thieves? by threats and by fear of punishments and by having rules that all of those things are not somebody's natural state. Those are created by the living in the authoritarian paradigm that my children never have to lie because there's no, there's no punishment uh, to fear. They're honest with me because, because living in partnership, we have this foundation of love and trust that they come to me and it's never necessary to lie um, because they don't like get in trouble. There's times where um, we're human beings, we get upset, but we talk about it. Uh, cheating, there's, what, why, there's no need to cheat anything. There's no test. There's no hoops to jump through to get from point A to point B. They go, they go from point A to point B whenever they want to. They go to point Z. I mean, it's, there, there's nothing to need to get around for their freedom. They have it. And so I feel like people that lie, cheat, and steal are severely misunderstood sometimes. Sometimes, yes, there, maybe there is not good people out there but in general people don't want to be doing those things did did you want to cheat on that test in school or were you petrified of what would happen to you if you didn't pass that class or get a good grade you know these things that are created in children that they go on to be as adults are purely a result of living in a, with the authoritarian paradigm and living under uh somebody else's rule so when a children are when children are empowered and they live in partnership with their parents the values and morals that are that these children live by, they have the highest of standards for themselves. This I've never seen this happen. So another awesome question, Nathaniel, and I hope that answered it. All right, thanks so much. Uh, it's been a great and interesting talk. Uh, we hope to have you back sometime soon. Uh, thanks so much. I'd thanks everybody for coming tonight. Oh, actually, we've got one more question right under the wire here. Uh, Nathaniel asks, could you talk a little more about your thoughts on, uh, on college? Um, my thoughts on uncollege. Well, I had an amazing speaker at the last event that I hosted who talked a lot about the whole uncollege movement and, and people mentoring one another and doing your research and educating yourselves. Again, it really comes down to children getting used to taking the responsibility to not be spoon fed knowledge. Um, we, we create lazy learners uh, by spoon feeding them what we think they should know. And uh, college is never really necessary unless there's a very specific profession that requires that, such as becoming a doctor or lawyer or the, you know, those rare professions that are, that are needed in our world. I, I honor those and respect those. Um, if a child is internally, a, a human being in general is internally motivated to learn something, they do so easily. And um, 
college is a really different experience for unschoolers than most kids in school because they go to college oftentimes for freedom. I've spoken with several unschoolers who are in college, who chose college and said that they can't believe how immature kids that have been in high school are in college, that they couldn't even relate. They didn't understand why all they did was party and why they didn't they didn't uh, do any of their work or study. They, they went just to escape and to be free. So that's why so few people use what they actually learn in college, because the intent of going is not for a profession like um, they want to tell their parents and the adults why they're going. They're going to finally feel some freedom. And so they, they kind of go crazy because they've been so controlled. So unschooled kids that attend college, and again, there are some going to Harvard right now, and I know several unschool, unschoolers that choose college, generally they start much younger. And the experience is very powerful for them because these colleges are looking for unschoolers now. Their, their resumes, their applications look completely different than these cookie cutter applications that every other college sees. When they see a self-motivated learner and they read the uniqueness and the life experience that these kids have, man, these colleges are, are waiting for these kids to enter and change the world and really be passionate and motivated. So again, there are so many great resources out there for college, Nathaniel. Just do a Google search and you'll you'll be very filled with lots of information. But there's a book out there. Um, oh, there's several books. I'm trying to think of one in particular. Dale, a gentleman named Dale sent me a copy of his book. Um, send me a message, I'll find out the name of it. But um, he wrote a whole book on it, on the Young College Movement. So thank you guys so much for having me tonight. Right. It was an honor. This this philosophy is very in-depth, and I barely, so picture an iceberg. I gave you the very tip of this whole philosophical perspective. I am so happy to be a resource to you. I'd love to come back. I really enjoy connecting with you all. If you want to learn more about unschooling, check out my videos, my work, articles, books on danamartin.com. Please uh, send me a message anytime. And I'm also happy to do parenting coaching with those of you that want a more individualized approach. So thank you again so much. Thank you. Take care. Have a good night. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Take care.